<laughs> let me know if it works. But go ahead. I'm delighted. I'm delighted by that. Honestly, by the time we're done recording, I'm just like, it's been hours, man. Yeah, I don't know yeah. what was said. I don't know in what order it was said. So yeah, I barely like, remember last week. Editing, I, mean, I like but... I like watching them again. It's like I, know. you know, sometimes yeah. I crack myself up. Oh no, 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 no. <laughs> me too. I love I love listening to them after they're yeah, done. I it's just that I don't remember it how it was before the edits. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm just like. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. What is your uh, one that can't be, can't talk bill? Ah, <laughs> uh, it's really good though. It's, it's fun. Oh, um, good. so, <laughs> so my next one is the red detachment of women. Um, cool. so this is a 1960s, um, Chinese communist party propaganda film that is an incredible watch. Honestly, I find it so fascinating to watch because one of the things that I study is propaganda. Um, mm. I've seen a decent number of propaganda films um, from all different countries, all different um, regimes, all of that. Um, I've actually seen probably, and I'm familiar more with um, stuff out of Cuba and the United States, like kind of during the whole, like, you know, post second Cuban revolution situation. <laughs> um, but this was a really fun one to kind of start dipping my toe into like stuff out of out of China um, after the uh, communist uh, revolution there. So this film is really interesting to me. Um, so it's it's basically kind of inspired by and is a very, 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 very loose retelling of the story of Hua Mulan. So it it kind of follows that with like this um this like woman who ends up joining the military, fighting for um her community and her country and um in particular while the Communist Party was working to kind of you know overtake things. So um, kind of the the main protagonist of this is um, named. Uh, I like that actress, by the way. She's she's very good in it. Yeah. Um, so the character's name is um, Wu Chenghua, and the actress. I have to look up her name, unless you know it off the top of your head, Henry. No, I wasn't. I'd never yeah. seen her before, but yeah, but she she's really good. She's good. She's good. Uh, the actress's name is. Uh... Oh, uh, uh, Zhu, uh, she won. So phenomenal. Yeah. Like she, mm. she did a great job in this film. Um, I've definitely liked to kind of check out more. Um, so basically, uh, the story follows, um, this woman, uh, Wu Chonghua. And so she is a servant on, um, Hainan Island. And so, uh, the, the kind of like chieftain of the island basically um, is her like, you know, feudal overlord basically and uh, very terribly mistreats her as well mm -hmm. as other servants. He it whips her. Him. He's very cruel. Yeah. yeah torturing. Very ba bad dude. Bad Movie dude starts around. with torturing mm -hmm. her pretty much. It starts with torture and it only gets better from there is, is what I got to tell you about this movie. <laughs> um, so of course, um, you know, Chonghua escapes uh, from this situation. She gets with this guy who, um, uh, Hong Chungking, Ch Chungqing. And so he, uh, he helps her um, escape and he basically is just like, hey, you should consider joining this regiment of of women fighters that we're working on over here. And she's just like, you know, that sounds like a great idea. She decides to go do that. Um, she meets up with another uh, woman who is a widow and doesn't want to just have this like sad life as being a widow and nothing else. Uh, so the two of them decide to join up. And you, uh, you follow them to the camp where all the training is happening. There's this like... Um, uh like a demonstration of the women who are in this regiment um they're really cool they're uh all very coordinated it's it's like beautiful you know if, if you ever have seen like uh like drill team type of stuff like with military things and like i gotta say like you know u.s military like drill team stuff is is good but like chinese stuff like takes it to another level it's it's intense like it's 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 an art form in and of itself honestly right. it's really cool it's really really cool um so you kind of see them and they're just like oh these women are so cool and so badass i want to, i'm excited like about joining this and uh kind of the guys who were um leading this like give all their like propaganda speeches you know like oh we gotta we gotta you know defeat our feudal overlords and um you know, make a, make a better society and all of that. Um, and I do want to be very clear before I go any further into this with like the propaganda stuff. It's like, 
I can appreciate it because regardless of how I feel about the political situation, I appreciate seeing how the characters talk about it in the film. Um, and I appreciate the significance of this as a historical film. Well, it's um, their, from it's this their era. life. You're seeing their yeah. life. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's really it's really really interesting to me. Um, <clears throat> so they they uh, they join up, um, and then uh, Chung Hua ends up going on several different missions, um, ultimately to help take over Hainan Island, and of course she wants revenge on this evil motherfucker who abused her. So <laughs> she can't help herself. Every time she sees him somewhere, she's just like, "I'm gonna kill this guy," and she fires upon him. She faces military discipline for it, and she's like, I don't care. I need to kill him. I need I need to kill this guy. Understandable. Um, <laughs> what'd you say? Understandable. I'm totally understandable. If somebody, like, you know, tortured, whipped, beat me, mm -hmm. and exploited me for labor, I'd want to kill him, too. I understand. Revenge Drive <laughs> is very human. I get it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, she and... Um, she and um, Chung Jing uh, end up... Uh, working together on a mission and basically try to infiltrate this guy's fortress um, and try to like, you know, find the weak points and all of that uh, so that folks can, you know, get in and take over it. They end up, um, I think, taking it briefly. He retakes it and then they have to do it again. Uh, he ultimately ends up dying and his death um, ends up paving the way for her to have a leadership position um, because she basically takes over his job because he was kind of the uh, Communist Party like um, representative for this for this group. Um, and she ends up taking over that role. And um, where the film ends is like, you know, the the revolution is still going on, but she ends up being in that role. So she is basically leading um, this this female detachment um uh in in that so it's it's kind of like she gets fully like brought into it she becomes this like really inspiring figure and so like looking at the film which was made in the 60s and uh is set in the 30s you can imagine seeing thinking of like uh you know the message of this movie as it was intended for its target audience which is you know the people of china um during this period after you know it's it's like right before the really really big cultural revolution and it continues to play a really key role in the development of that cultural revolution so you would see people watching this and especially women watching this and thinking oh you know we can do our part too you know um women can can fight for you know the the common goal of supporting the ideals of this of this party and and the values that it has so then um, this film came out in 1961, and then it was adapted into a ballet. Um, the ballet yeah. is, <laughs> yeah, hmm. yes, I, I hear we have some knowledge about the uh, propaganda ballets, which is interesting. Um, yes, so those are uh, those are called, I'm trying to find, I had it pulled up, what they're called, the Chinese word for it. Um, where did it go? I swear I had it pulled up. Where did it go? This is driving me crazy. Um, I'm, I'm oh, uh, young young bungee is what they're called, <laughs> and so these are revolutionary theatrical works. And uh, mm -hmm. then this was then it once it was uh, adapted into a ballet, which was um, like yeah, one of a the very popular one that you know pe officials would bring people to and everything. It was like this whole huge, huge, huge thing. Wasn't that in 1970? It was the ballet? 1970. Um, it looks it's like 1980. yes, 1970 was the ballet, okay. and then it was adopted in, adapted into a film. So another adaptation two years mm -hmm. later in 1972. Um, so profoundly important uh film historically, and Absolutely. then the ballet, and then the additional film. Um, I've only seen the original film, I have not seen the uh the uh, uh ballet film adaptation, right. but yeah, it's it's really cool. Just kind of like the you know one iteration and another and another, and all in like relatively short succession. This is a period over you know twelve years total, mm -hmm. which is just kind of cool. I think. Um, yeah, so I just I find this really historically fascinating. Honestly, yeah. Yeah, no, this is an interesting one because much like with a uh, Lady Snowblood to Song of Vengeance or Love Song of Vengeance, 
I did not get to watch Red Detachment of Women, but I mm -hmm. kind of good, good of put it on your list. Booked it yeah. in my algorithm. Yeah. And yeah, when yeah. I looked it up, so cool. I've I've got it set to watch. I just have not had time yet. Oh, well, that's a good thing to but, do uh, discuss though. Yeah. Thank um you. but when I did, I just noticed lots of different clips of the ballet. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Uh, it's kind of interesting with the tradition of revolutionary ballets and whatnot, because mm -hmm. there was one that played around here just recently Ooh, that seemed as though it was very much kind of a counter revolutionary version mm. of that. Yeah. And that would happen because um, the, the interesting thing is like, you know, culturally with, with China and like, you've got people who are very, very strongly supportive of the regime that, you know, currently has power there, and you have people just as intense about the opposition to it. And mm -hmm. so I could definitely see people taking like these, these like propaganda, um, like cultural revolution ballets and, and kind of turning them on their head. So yeah. that's, that's really interesting. I, I would, I wish I could see that. That sounds really cool. <laughs> interesting. So uh, it's me and Chuck. Uh, do you want to flip a coin or... <laughs> I'll, I'll go. I'll give you time to. I'm just also going to insert a quick, uh, I will be yeah. right back. I'm going to turn my camera off and I will be oh, back. Uh, in like you also, can, you, can you tell um, the audience that something they need to know about, you know? Yes, I can tell the audience things that they need to know. <laughs> More than happy to do that. So if you are enjoying what we're doing here, we would very much appreciate it if you would subscribe to the channel here so that you can get updates on our new videos as they come out. Um, Henry's doing an amazing job editing these, as we talked about, kind of splicing stuff together in interesting ways. Um, and then you can see them as soon as they're available. Uh, if you can like the video, that does us a lot of good to help us grow our audience. Um, and especially like for me personally, I really love to see comments on this because we really want to have a conversation with you guys about all of this stuff. We've got a couple of regular commenters who I appreciate so much. I always love hearing what they have to say. And I really would like to kind of boost our engagement and community here because we're really trying to build something where it's not just us being a bunch of nerdy talking heads at you guys. We right. really want to we want to hear your thoughts on the films we're talking about sure. or what you're curious about. If something sounds interesting, you're like, oh, I'm adding that to my watch list. That sounds cool. Or, oh, I checked this out because you know, Bill talked about this like absolutely insane sounding movie and I, I've got to go check it out, you know, anything like that. Uh, would love to, love to, love to see that. Very cool. So you need to step off for a minute? Yes, I will be right back though. Okay. So go ahead and I will rejoin in a second. Oh, okay. Um, I guess uh, I'm going to let you go, Chuck, because I do want Kaylin to be here when I do mine because there's some tie-in between mine and her earlier ones. So, uh, so what you got, sir? All right. Well, I am going to kind of flip the script a little bit from uh, what I did last week and uh, kind of go to okay. the one I had at the end. Um, this is uh, not a well-regarded film. Um, <laughs> in fact, it's one of those... Uh, <laughs> It's one of those, on a good uh, foot, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna deter you all right now. And it's just massive deterrence right here out of the starting gate. Uh, so the movie, I'm well, the character, the heroine that I'm going with is Barbara from Night of the Living Dead, mm. who you don't yeah. really ever think of as a woman warrior, but I'm talking about. Her portrayal by Patricia Tallman in the 1990 remake mm -hmm. by uh, by Tom Savini. Yeah, I don't I don't regard that film very well. I'll just go. Ahead a lot of folks that. don't apparently. I saw it in the theater opening night. I've I've tried, but Tony yeah, Todd oh, no. Tony Todd was perfectly cast though as Ben. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was. No, straight up, I loved it, and I loved the the inversions of the movie, particularly yeah, so. with mm -hmm. Barbara and. Mm -hmm. uh, just kind of the way they really flipped the script on the, that character to where she was basically kind of a catatonic basket case through most of it to as soon as she collects herself in the first 15, 20 minutes of the movie, she's killing zombies. 
and she mm -hmm. basically never stops killing zombies. Not sure what we're talking about, but I just got back and I walked in at an interesting moment. I like killing zombies. <laughs> Dawn, Dawn, of <laughs> Dead, Dawn of the Dead remake, 1990. Ah, yes. Awesome. With uh, Or Night of the Living Dead remake with... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. But but you know it, it, it they made they remade it to look more like the other dead movies. Hmm. Yeah. In my opinion, they're coming to get you, Barbara. Oh no no no, they're not coming to get you. You're coming to get them. Okay. <laughs> but uh, love it. I'm scared. Go ahead. But just uh, basically, she pretty much turns into the token badass <laughs> character of the whole thing, and uh, is that wasting zombies somehow makes it back alive uh sees that almost everybody else in the house is dead except for the one guy that she ends up plugging by herself mm -hmm. and uh cooper cooper yes and uh cooper played by uh tom tom tolls yeah and mm -hmm. uh who is twice the disgusting weasel that he is in the original but uh Tom Tolles is pretty disgusting in Henry Porter of a serial killer. Uh you, you can't get much more disgusting than that performance. Tom Tolles is terrifying. <laughs> yes. As Otis. Yes. Uh that's uh there's one scene that every time a I very see disturbing that once, movie. Oh my god. Yeah. So continue, and, sorry. Uh, nah, it's that's all good. But anyway, that's just that's all I got on that one. Okay. Um do you want us to come back around to you in a minute or do you want to mention something else? Uh, just, I guess I'll just uh, impart the same message. You know, like, share, and subscribe. All yeah. right. And on that note, <laughs> on that note, Uncle Chuck got to go see a man about a dog. I'll be right oh. back. Oh, okay. You're coming right. back? I'll be back, yeah. Okay, okay, cool. Okay. So, I just ran out of my beverage and I was like, I need more caffeine to... Oh, <laughs> Man, like I just oh it's been it's been a day and it's been a week and it's yes. been a month and it's been a 2024 so far. So that, that's the <laughs> it's truth. just like I'm just over here like guzzling monster zeros. <laughs> so mm -hmm. <laughs> so um I'm gonna do mine next because I want to get her out of the way because it's a little involved. Um kind of the crux of, of what I decided to work on. Um awesome. So I'm basically going to talk about two movies and they're both one or well, three movies, but one, one that's the most important one. But, uh, but the first one I want to talk about, and this is an extension of when I was talking about the history of Wuxia films. Mm -hmm. So the first Wuxia film was in 1928 and it was called the burning of the red Lotus temple. So that is now officially considered a lost film. Hmm. Also, yeah. also, it also is logged as one of the longest films ever made. It, I think it's 28 hours long. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, take that, Lynch, with your return. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, they're actually movies way longer than 28 hours long, I found out. But um, oh, that's bananas! <laughs> red, red heroin. I love long films, but oh my god! <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's 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 interesting. Um, mm -hmm. but uh, so red heroin, uh, or the translation of the Chinese was the red errant night, uh, and it comes from this uh, uh, wuxia uh, thing called the something of you know, the knights errant that was written several decades earlier, a Wuxia novel, but it's just kind of loosely based on that. Um, but the, the, it's based on that concept, but it's, it's a woman character. So Red Heroine is obviously not Red Hero, but so this one is still extant and you can get it. And uh, there's a version that they did a modern soundtrack to that's just incredible soundtrack. I was listening to it earlier. You could just put the soundtrack on and it's amazing, but it's still in pretty decent shape. There's a purple tinted one with that soundtrack on youtube and uh the story is pretty simple so the way I, the way i get this plot it's pretty straightforward yeah yun or yun so she's a country girl who lives in a village and she's played by someone named fan shu ping and she uh the people in the village are resisting the western army you know i don't know enough about the politics our history of that era to know exactly what that means i know it had significance but um cultural disconnect on that one 
uh, and they're led by a fictional villain. Uh, his name is uh, Jin Jin Zim, Zimon Jimon, and mm -hmm. uh, Jimon basically fucks with Yoon's whole family and friends, and he's trying to get this girl named Kyung Er. And he tries to rape her, undresses her, he tries to rape her. Uh, and then um, he uh, is rebuffed, but then he basically just captures, they swoop in and capture a bunch of women from the village to be their sex slaves and concubines. So that's that's the crux of the story. So we're already getting into, this is already one of the first rape revenge movies ever made. Mm -hmm. Squarely. It's also the first, the second Wuxia movie. And it's also another first, I'll get to in a minute, which might, might surprise y'all, um, or might not. But um, <laughs> but basically, uh, the general uh, has this sidekick. And I mean, it's really funny when uh, Americans would make fun of Chinese people like during World War II or even into the 50s with buck teeth and crazy. So this guy actually is made up to look that way. And that's one of those... And I, I see that in a lot of Chinese movies of that era. So it makes me feel weird when white people get all mad and say, we can't do that. I'm not saying white people should do it, but they're like, nobody should do it. It's like, well, that that's their culture. If they want to do it, you know. Yeah, but, you, you cannot uh, stop someone from doing something within their own culture. Right. Um, and, and like, especially like, that's not really our job to critique that if, if they want to talk about that and have a conversation about that, that's cool. But I feel like it's, it's, it's just none of my business. You know, that's, that's not for yeah, me. Yeah. And, and, and as usual, I just took, take the art. Yeah. Like sometimes, like page. sometimes as a queer person, it's like, I'll see people like critiquing like certain things and just be like, actually it's fine you know it's it's okay like it's fiction it's really a story no, yeah. it's an imaginary story right um but in this case <laughs> so they uh basically rape loot and pillage the village it's pretty pretty straightforward like it's like an iron maiden song or something and <laughs> you know so <laughs> it does sound like an iron maiden there's a guy song. named white monkey uh and uh his neural name is joy yin fong played by Koi Yitang. And anyway, he's like a hermit sorcerer, sort of, a mystic. And uh, he snatches Yoon from out of this environment. So as that's going on, it's getting worse. The general finally, uh, you know, and his sidekick, who I said that the fucked up teeth, and he's also got like the biggest beard I've ever seen. He's really her suit. He looks like a, a wolf man. I mean, <laughs> it's, but he's supposed to be just a hairy guy from what I read. But they look at, went a little crazy with this fuzzy makeup. And um, so those two basically are, re are ready to, if this girl doesn't give in, uh, they're just going to kill her whole family and maybe just wipe out the whole village. So in the meantime, while they've been debating this, which is probably only a matter of days or weeks that this situation has been going on, uh, White Monkey has managed to train Yoon in all kinds of mystical and magical arts. Uh, and so she emerges as red heroine. Uh, <laughs> she appears in a puff of smoke. Um, <laughs> she flies. She climbs walls. Um, and there's another particular guy named Ah Ab Bao, who was a villain who kept trying to rape Keong. Keong's very popular among these rapists. I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't remember which actress it was, but uh, uh, whatever. So, um, he gets his comeuppance. Red heroin kicks his ass, and they save the city. They save the family. Um, it's not as prosaic as it sounds. Uh, the pacing actually is pretty good. I mean, it's slow, but it's you know, with the music and the the a lot of the camera stuff is is pretty fluid for the time. Um, but yeah, they uh, go ahead and you know dispatch the general. So you've got the idea that I mentioned earlier in Wuxia that these people are. They're like anti-authority. They're like individualistic. You know, they're like the lone gunfighter. You know, they don't they don't work for any company. You know, they, you know they. Uh, it's all about the common person, and so that's exactly what has happened. Is even though we don't really see the journey process in this movie, which that's what a movie like this now would be based around. It's all off camera, but we do see the the what it's yielded, and so this woman, yeah, she's super strong. She knows martial arts. 
She can climb walls. She can fly. Uh, she can appear and disappear in a puff of smoke. Um, and, you know, Red Heroin is a pseudonym. And the translation of her Chinese name is Red Errant Knight. And so Red Heroin is a pseudonym. She's partially masked. Through, well, she's masked here through a lot of her appearances until finally, you know, they learn who she is. She takes the one veil off. So my argument is this is after Judex and Nick Tlope, this has to be the first superhero on earth that I hmm. can I mean, Nick Tolope, 1912, Judex, 1913. I can't think of anyone between that and 1929 that had all those specific uh, secret identity, certain powers, you know, all, just a whole costume, you know, just the whole thing of what she differentiates a superhero maybe from a pulp hero like Dyke Savage, who arguably could also be considered a pulp hero. I think the secret identity is a big part of what makes them different. Like the shadow, Batman, Judex, which are all the same line of thought, you know, Judex spawned the shadow, the shadow spawned Batman. Um, but it's interesting to see this in a, in 1928 Chinese movie and that it's a woman. So I would say she's the first uh, female superhero depicted visually that I'm aware of at this point. So hey, Henry, I gotta, I gotta check out, but, Okay. This is really interesting. Um, hey, can I make a suggestion? Yeah. Could we like in in the descriptions for the videos maybe make a list of the films we cover? Because I find myself, oh God, yes. Yes. I find myself wanting to remember what that. was that one case. See, I've been wanting to do it. that, and it's yeah. Just, yeah, I'm just overwhelmed, but I'm getting to it. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. absolutely. And I, I mean, like Henry, if you want help, like logistically well, making done that so happen, many now. I can I can like go through and try to find them. I just think it would it would be nice to be able to add yeah, we'll those figure so it that out. Absolutely. You can go find stuff and and like our audience can go find stuff. Yeah. I think that'd be that'd be useful. Thank Excellent you guys. Idea, it was great seeing y'all. Okay. Take care. Bye sir. Bill. Have Take a good care. night. You have a good and night, that buddy. There were three. Thank you. <laughs> Here comes Agatha Christie. Oh shit, does this mean I'm the final girl? <laughs> maybe so um uh, <laughs> uh so red heroin so yeah it was good um yeah. so let's flash forward to 1966 so we've got this guy king who and um <clears throat> he was doing wuxia like movies or you know heroic sword movies but historical movies but you know pretty much he, he, he never was very prolific but you know he worked behind the scenes in the industry in the 50s a lot and came up in the 60s just as shaw brothers was kind of coming up too and uh come drink with me is kind of his breakout movie and a lot of people still consider his his best movie um i think it does have some competition but uh i think it probably is the best movie but um in this movie cheng pei pei so she was an unknown 19 year old uh athlete and ballet dancer and you know just i, I got I, I i'm sorry if i start if i start swooning i mean just just I understand. Just I was mind numbing you earlier, so I, I have Golden <laughs> Swallow on on the te television right now. It's like just mind numbingly beautiful, like perfection. Yeah. You know, like I understand. Just a golden You'll be standing by with the smelling salt. The uh, <laughs> the uh, the the person who is very attracted to beautiful women in me sees the person who is attracted to beautiful women in you. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> I get it. I al I always bond with my lesbian friends on that level. <laughs> <laughs> but, something uh, we can all bond over <laughs> right uh, well, uh, yes so she, okay. <laughs> um, she is the star and she plays golden sparrow so golden sparrow mm -hmm. basically at, at the movie's outset is kind of a mystery it's almost like the batman you know it's almost like some yeah. pseudonym for some warrior and no one they're talked about they're feared but none of the people in the main plot have yet encountered them um and so uh, it starts with like a caravan and there's a guy in one of those which they call palanquins i have no idea why a chinese uh, uh cart has a french sounding name but one day i'll re research it but it's like palanquin. It's... It's a cool name cool cool yeah I, I i think it's just uh i think it's just that you know it's 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 one of those things where it's like it's a, it's a word in a language and then they just continue using that word to describe the same thing no matter mm. what culture it's it's being used in okay that makes sense so so this guy's in this and he gets stopped by these warriors and they're led by this, you know, insanely uh, over made up guy. He's got like pure white, like the Joker, but it's definitely makeup um, and uh, just crazy eyeshadow and wild hair. And of course, the, the de rigueur, 
you know, uh, kung fu outfit where it's all white with very cool outfit with the little boots that had the little things on them. And um, he's uh, he's named Jade Face Tiger. Um, and he has uh, he accosts this guy and he's like, well, you know, you got to tell the governor to let one of our guys go free. And the guy in the pallet one's like, no, we can't do that. He was a criminal. He's like, okay, well, we're taking you and we're going to torture you. And he's like, but my my father is the governor. And they're like, well, then he'll give our guy back if we start torturing his son. So, <laughs> so into that, you have this classic scenario that's been imitated innumerable times in innumerable action movies and even in some of King Who's other movies. But it's the archetypal... A young man goes into a bar, sits down, really quiet, circumspect. It's kind of almost like the gunfighter, spaghetti western movies too. Um, everybody stares at him, doesn't know what their deal is. Gradually, you know, there starts to become tension and somebody gets in a fight. And this person turns out to be more than they bargained for and kicks a lot of ass. So, you know, it's in the movie Django, for instance. Of course, in that case, you know, the machine gun really kind of put it way over the edge. But... Um, well, he didn't use the machine gun in the bar, but so in this case, that happens. Everyone thinks Golden Swallow is a boy uh, because they have visual problems. I mean, her hair's tied up, right? But that makes her look like a boy. So I, I, it's, it's, I guess for that culture, it's plausible. But for our culture, it seems a little like a stretch, like Clark Kent and Superman with the glasses. But whatever, I'm going to go with it. It's obviously, it's a trope of these movies. And um, so eventually they realize that this person's Golden Swallow. And her moves are incredible. Her weapons of choice are these two knives. She doesn't hold the knives like this with the knife coming up. She holds them sideways like she's stabbing downward. And she slashes this way and that way. And she's, it is like a ballet kind of thing. So she's always creating a distance between people in front of behind and behind her and then we'll switch here and usually kill those two people and you know eventually they realize she's a woman and that's really not i'm really not important the important thing is that they realize they find out that she's the governor's daughter so she's the sister of the guy being tortured to death and she wants his freedom and they start to kind of get a one-up on her in battle and there's this guy this drunken character named drunken cat and <laughs> uh the actual translation of the film, Come Drink With Me, this is kind of interesting, I, I thought, uh, is, if I can find it. Oh, let me see if I can find it. Okay, that's on Golden Sparrow. Other notes. I'm not, okay, I can't find the name but this is a Chinese phrase and it means great drunken hero. So technically this drunken hobo that she bums into in the bar, he's actually the titular hero, but he's not nearly as, and it's, it's really, you know, part of it's more his story. It's like his story. You find out over time, her story is like right in the middle. You know, I've got to free my brother. I work for the government and there's all this politics and there's this crazy guy with white makeup who, who's like a master killer. But drunken uh, hero has like a um, connection to these to these villains, and it's because he actually was a master martial artist, and he studied behind alongside this guy named Liao Kun, and I forgot the name of their teacher. So their teacher died, and the secret, which are you know symbolized by this long wooden uh, pole that he carries. Uh, that's kind of taken with him. Like he's meant to be the master, but he has two problems. One, he, he actually, yes, he is an alcoholic and yes, he does work it into his fighting style, like Jackie Chan later did and all that stuff. But not only that, but, uh, he has to defeat this Liao Kun guy because Liao Kun guy didn't just take what was rightfully his heirs, but now he's an abbot in a temple pretending to be a holy man and untouchable. So this drunken guy is basically like, you know, golden swallow. You kind of help me with this thing. I'll help mm -hmm. you with that. And it's really kind of, it's really kind of over her head. I mean, because they're so tied closely together that when you finally kill off, uh, 
you know, when you finally get rid of Jade Face Tiger, then, you know, that's the main threat eliminated for her and her family. But by this time, the abbot has found them and he's confronted the drunk guy and he's like, you know, I'm not going to give you the you know, the rights. You know, I'm, it's, I'm, I took the legacy and drunken cat's like, okay, well then, you know, I'm, I'm going to have to kill you. I mean, he's not saying it to me. He's just like, that's just what I have to do, you know? <laughs> So they meet the next day and, you know, have quite a fight and drunken cat, you know, he kills the motherfucker and, and he is a motherfucker. He's, he's mm -hmm. like the typical guy who's like, I can kill anybody with impunity because, because I belong to the sect and this monastery, like the church, you know, and, um, because it turns out really in martial arts prowess, drunken, drunken cat actually is, is more effective than he is. And it kind of leads Golden Sparrow to, uh, Golden Sparrow to go to kind of, I guess, a happy uh, resolution, kind of an open ended thing on her part. Um, you know, she's almost becomes by this time the sidekick to the drunken cat. And I do think that's deliberate, but given the title of the movie and the focus that it goes in. But, and this is my only criticism of this movie because I think it's brilliant, but I think it undermines from the, from the woman warrior point of view. It mm -hmm. under it undermines the long <laughs> spaghetti western face off thing and what comes after that when you finally see who she is and how powerful she is and what she can do and you're like okay it's about her and then you realize the movie's really not about her <laughs> it's like it's like okay so why did you spend forty five minutes on her I mean I get it she's gorgeous and can fight but <laughs> you know the rest of us are like what's her what's her what's her happy reward. Yeah. So they made a sequel. It was a huge giant hit and it was an import hit. And um two years later, uh Chung Cha I finally found out how to pronounce this guy's name. Ch Chang Che, who's directed more martial arts movies than anyone in history. I think he's directed sixty. I've seen forty of his movies. <laughs> I've seen more of him than any other director. And I've nice. seen finished. But he's directed a lot of classics and uh but Tony Raines, who's this British scholar who knew a lot of these people he hung out in hong kong in the 70s uh he he gives you the correct pronunciations on the blu-rays and he says it's pronounced chung cha not like mm -hmm. not like chung chu it's just like cha yeah like you know you don't have yeah. quite got a vowel so yeah so chung cha <laughs> um i know i'll be, i'll call chang che on and off i'm not careful but anyway chung cha he uh he directs a sequel and it's really uh one of his most visually artsy movies you, i can tell he's kind of trying to create the milieu of a king who movie because king hughes production values are i mean there are great movies that chung cha and, and, and lao car leong and all these guys directed in the 70s that are much nicer looking than than when we saw them panned and scanned and dubbed and crappy mm -hmm. in, the, in the 90s on tv i mean a lot of them remastered look great like king boxer looks incredible like a diagram pole fighter or 36 Chamber Shaolin. You know, they remastered all of these mm -hmm. in Chinese. And you know, I, yes, I have all of them. And, um, you know, they, <laughs> they're, they're just great. But every once in a while, a director will kind of raise their game. And, uh, you know, like Chung Cha, his stuff is more concentrated on the storytelling and the action as time goes on and the whole idea of the chivalrous hero and also lots and lots and lots of blood and gore and a lot of homoerotic blood and gore. That's a whole nother story for another day. He has a fetish. Tony Raines talked about it. I read it years ago and I read about it years ago in this book called Kung Fu Cult Heroes, which if you don't know anything about these movies, that should be the first Ooh. book you buy. Okay, I'm, I'm literally writing that down. In Kung Fu Cult Heroes. So in that Kung book, he explores the homoerotic aspect of these heroes and how they were attractive to women to other men you know gay men and also as ideals for men and but you know they had a lot of effeminate Thanks. qualities but one of the things that one of the fetishes that chung cha and a couple of these other filmmakers had is when they defeat them it's like this wound to their groin either they kick them or smash them and they're just like blood soaking their pants you know, oh when, I, when I read about these, I was like, is it really like that? And yeah, it's really like that. Oh, my God. 
<laughs> it's like you can't Talk be a little CBT. more blank. <laughs> it's like I am going to destroy your genitals now. Um, mm-hmm. But the thing is, uh, this was before uh, Chung got lost in the <clears> labyrinth. <throat> so he's kind of early on. And he's like, okay, I'm going to kind of ape King Hu a little bit. But yeah, it is a lot bloodier and gorier than the previous one. Um, and the action for Golden Swallow in the Golden Swallow sequel, which called Golden Swallow this time. And you would think now it's really about her. Well, no, the main character is uh, Silver Rock, played by Jimmy Wang Yu, who got massively famous that decade playing the one-armed swordsman, which I think is incredible in that. But Jimmy Wang Yu is basically like this cocky fighter. He's dressed in all white. He's got a scar down the side of his face. Totally the opposite of one-armed swordsman. He's he's like all polished, and yes, he has all his limbs. And he leaves this calling card, this little kind of bird-shaped dagger. Whenever he uh, attacks, he's like a vigilante, and he attacks like these packs of bandits and 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 you know some people who are like in the military, whoever he feels like you know killing. He's like a killing machine. But the problem is that little thing that he leaves as the calling card that was golden swallows calling card in the previous movie the golden swallow has now semi-retired the re Mm -hmm. we what we do find out is that she's like basically living this not monastic life but she's living i mean she doesn't dress any differently or anything or having different skills but she's her and these two male friends who they're they're platonic though lo lay plays one of them who played king boxer uh you know he became famous in 72 for that uh King Boxer, a.k.a. The Five Fingers of Death. The movie that the Iron Fist Marvel character ripped off. And mm. and Roy Thomas, the creator, told me he, he ripped it off. So, you know. But I even described watching Five Fingers of Death in the theater. Like, I want a character named Iron Fist who gets that power. But, um, so he's really cool. He's a sympathetic character, low lay, but he's you know, he's, he's a laid-back guy. I forgot the other guy's name, but they, basically just they hang out in the woods and kind of philosophize while Lole is praying she's going to fall in love with him. So they start hearing that, you know, there's these murders committed with her calling card and they have to solve it. And eventually they come face to face with them. And uh, it's pretty intense. I mean, uh, Silver Rock does some, he does some outrageous fucking shit. Like he comes into this one uh, building and, you know, he fight all the, all the soldiers are at orange and you know, he's in white and you see him like in close qu- quarters combat just killing one after the other it goes on for a while and then you see a shot from above and he's standing right in the middle in the white they're all dead in these orange robes and then he picks up a a a torch drops it and then he walks out of it it's not like the current movies where they walk out of it and explodes explodes behind him but when he walks out suddenly the flame gets bigger and a couple of people like wander out who are on flame and he just whacks them down and keeps going so he's like a real like mass murderer I mean, it seems like most of the people he's murdering deserve it, but maybe not all. Um, And he doesn't really care. So apparently he's doing a lot of this to get Golden Swallow's attention. So they spent part of their childhood together. And he's obviously, they don't use these terms in the movie, but he's obviously a mentally messed up character. And um, there's a great scene where they figure out who he is and... um, Golden Sparrow is explaining it to her two buddies. And man, it's like Hitchcock and um, what's that actress Hitchcock was madly in love with? He played Marnie. Tippy Hedron. Tippy Hedron. I mean, you know, Hitchcock would have Hitchcock would have the story going along, <laughs> and all of a sudden, this incongruous cut to this insane soft, soft focus, you know, uh portrait of her, you know, and I'm like, it was so terrible, such terrible filmmaking. From such a master and but you know mm-hmm. a few people have told me that he was madly in love with her and he felt that he needed to insert those shots of her that had gone out of vogue like 15 years earlier for actresses uh, in a narrative film because he was madly in love with her so he mm-hmm. wanted the whole world to see to be hedron and soft focus oh, it's, gosh. Like, it's like hitch hey hitch the movie's grinding to a halt over here sean connery's <laughs> talking over here there's a there's a movie going on and you're just like ah oh, i worry yeah. about being like that sometimes too i'm just like am i am i am i being a little bit too like oh 
about no, this I'm person. Just like, uh, <laughs> it's just the, the lighting is so ostentatious, and I've gone back yeah. and forth with people on this. Oh I mean, I personally, I personally, I that's one of Hitch's movies I just I think is a loser, and for a mm. lot of reasons, <laughs> that, and most of them are technical, and most of them are where he was lazy when he had the money, and I know he was trying to make artificial towns. You know, I get that. You know, that's Tim Burton's whole career, but I mean. <laughs> there's a point where the artifice becomes too much too on the nose you know yeah. and where it's a little too blatant that yes alfred we know you're in love with tippy hedron now, can we just get on with the fucking movie please <laughs> all right you know? let's go and so that's no, you kind don't of understand how beautiful she just move it along move it along, move it along. Yeah, these, so these scenes aren't <laughs> like that but they're slightly reminiscent of it because yeah. in um, Come Drink With Me, you know, when they finally, she has her hair down and she's really gorgeous and her skin is, the, the way she's lit, she's really like literally golden. And wow. in, in this movie, they they soften the lighting on her and, and she's not as uh, hyper kinetic a character. She does have fight scenes. She does acquit herself very well. But where we meet her early in the story where they're trying to figure out who is Silver Rock and they're still like hanging out in the woods. She starts telling the child his story, and it kind of cuts to her, and it's kind of like that. She's just staring straight ahead, and there's a soft focus light and almost like a halo. And I was like, she's the most beautiful woman on earth. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> so, you know, for people who love Tippy Hedren, I guess this is how they feel when they watch Marnie. So <laughs> this is how I feel <laughs> when I watch Golden Sparrow. I'm like there's Ching Pei Pei. I don't care about the story anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, so... Uh, and oh, so, God. I but what that. ends up happening is a love triangle. And of course, the psychotic uh, Silver Rock... Psychotic but well-intentioned warrior Silver Rock uh, tries to impress her. Lole impresses her because he's a down-to-earth kind person. And... It kind of peters out. After they kill most of the main villains and dispatch Jade Face Tiger, it's just, it's not really, uh, no, that's the other movie. Uh, dispatch, I forgot the name of the villain in this one. I can't remember his name. But um, it's like, who who cares? You know, it's like, um, it's a nice ending and a lot of Shaw Brothers period, period films that didn't tragically end, because many of them did, which is horrible, bloody, but very honorable deaths of their heroes and heroines. But in this kind of movie, you know, you'd get through the climax. The people that need to be dispatched are dispatched. Some of your favorite characters are dead. But the survivors are there, and they're going to kind of wander off into this, you know, uh, Zen paradise of whatever. You know, it has a mystical. And and when King Hu did Touch of Zen, he literally did it. He had them fighting the battles through the movie, and then these these super powered monks rescue them, and literally the super powered monks go and ascend into, <laughs> into heaven. And um, so, yes, I, uh, so Golden Sparrow sidelines the heroine, but mm -hmm. it doesn't in any way undermine the importance that her as a uh, an Asian action heroine was the first to make a significant mark, was the first to use the wuxia genre and the mm -hmm. first to have a movie that became a critical and a commercial hit worldwide. And she had a long career. Um but, uh, you know, ultimately she was in Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. She played Jade Fox. Mm -hmm. so, but she played the villain. And essentially in, in Crouching Tiger, you had like three three generations of characters. Her, yes. Michelle Yo and, and, you know, Zhang Ji and Jin. And, um, you know, I, I just, I tripped out on Jade Fox because I didn't know Ching Pei Pei was when I saw that movie in the theater. And I thought, mm -hmm. she, she looks like some evil witch. She starts <laughs> flipping around and i was like okay i get it she's the villain she's corrupting jen maybe she is in love with jen you know i was just trying to figure it out so then when i bought the dvd and i'm watching the behind the scenes they're like this is Chang pei pei and they start showing scenes from coming come during me and i'm like whoa and then they're and like, suddenly crush developed <laughs> well and then they're like then i was like oh she really actually did all those flips <laughs> i mean mm -hmm. Chow Yun Fat. That's what I love about these movies is just the fact that like these are these are real, like trained martial artists who are also actors. And yeah. it's 
I mean, God, Sha- like Shaoyun... getting, getting to watch the phenomenal acting and the phenomenal martial arts is just Absolutely. the coolest thing. I love it. I love it so much. And, and yeah. I mean, Chow Yun Fat, they used wires for most of his stuff. But yeah. People like Chang Fei Pei. I mean, you have to with Wu Sha too, because it's like people can't actually fly around like that. So. Yeah. And the, they did it all kinds of weird primitive ways. You know, they call it wire yeah. foo. And that kind of developed through the years with Shaw Brothers and different things. Mm-hmm. So you finally get uh, it became a whole kind of industry with y- the Yoon family. The Yoon mm-hmm. family kind of mastered all this action choreography and the wire foo. And mm-hmm. like Yoon Wo Ping, he was the fight choreographer on Crushing Diver Hidden Dragon. Mm-hmm. He also worked on X Men and The Matrix. So, in a short period of time, he kind of re- single handedly revolutionized the way action is done in mainstream. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he's Asian. But uh, <laughs> meanwhile, his brother Corey is choreographing these other movies, and his cousin uh, Bolo Young is an actor, you know, and they're all like, and they've all been working for like five generations since the Peking Opera. And, and it's mm-hmm. just, the, the whole, everything about the culture. And the stories they're telling about the culture, fiction or exaggerated or, or, or biographical, all the way to the way they make these movies and, and train to make these movies and learn their craft and then portray that stuff. It's like a whole continuum to me. I mean, our culture is mm-hmm. nothing like that. I'm not saying yeah. it should be or shouldn't be. I mean, the big the big selling point for a lot of people in the United States is we're, <clears throat> we are totally fragmented and melting pot. Uh, though that's starting to it's starting to hurt instead of help. And for it, it should make us a better culture, but instead we're all going to war with each other now. And, you know, mm. at some well, level. It's also, that's also complicated. Cause like regarding the melting pot thing, and this is something that like scholars in my field talk about a lot. Um, it's, it's like, we're not really a melting pot. Like that's, that's kind of the way that it's been presented as like the ideal is that everybody comes together and then we create this whole new no. culture that's an amalgam that's not how it is that's absolute it's never been like that. and it really, it really shouldn't have here's, been I here's mean, a culture here's a culture right. here's another, here's another one. and it's like it's more like a salad honestly yeah. and and i think that's better because sure. then like people don't have to give up their identities to be part of the bigger broader Absolutely. collective culture they still have their individuality they still have pride in where they come from um, and we can appreciate difference, but yeah, but that you're always, right. People it, like are also at each other's throats about it, and that really sucks. Well, I, I think it's mm-hmm. a it's a it's a yeah. it's a backlash from the fact that the people running things did yeah. try to make it a melting pot. Uh, they uh, did, yeah, no, and, uh, like assimilation bad, forced yes, assimilation col- bad, <laughs> colonizers and assimilation. That's, yes, and now people are finding their true selves, and they're waking up by the millions, and they're like, oh, mm-hmm. hey. You know, I'm I, I'm gay. I'm black. I'm a Native American Indian, and mm-hmm. I don't want the world to blow up in World War Three. I'm a good person. How come? Yeah, none of us want the world to blow up in World War Three. How come I don't have any money for food? We're on now. You know. Meanwhile, yeah. all the people who are trying to blow up the world and have the money for food, you know, right. they're, they don't give a fuck. <laughs> right. <laughs> Screw the Earth. We're gonna be dead in a few years. It's fine. Yeah. yeah. They're like, hopping on Elon's rocket. Stop. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's the Elon rocket brigade right there. I just don't even get me started on him. Okay, let's let's stop I know, I know. before I get angry and have an aneurysm. I was trying to keep it tied into you know. The, yeah. uh, okay, let's let's talk about movies. I'd rather talk well, about I'm, movies. Okay, I'm done with mine uh, for now. So who's next, Chuck? You had one more, didn't you? Yeah, I got one more. All right, buddy. Awesome. Like Kalen. Isn't it your turn? Oh.